So what I said was I was going to start with a poem. And um, it's by a woman named Chana Block called The Joins. And it's about a process that some of you may know in, uh, I think this is called Kitsuji. Uh, it's the Japanese art of mending precious metal with, uh, yeah, with gold. This is uh, her poem about this. She says, what's between us seems flexible as the webbing between forefinger and thumb. It seems flexible, but it isn't. What's between us is made of clay. And like any cup on a shelf, it shatters easily. Repair becomes the task. We glue the wounded edges with tentative fingers. And scar tissue is visible. History. And the cup is precious to us because we saved it. In the art of Kintsugi, a potter repairing a broken cup would sprinkle the resin with powdered gold. Sometimes the joints are so exquisite, they say the potter may have broken the cup just so they can mend it. And in a way, this is what I kind of want to talk about. I thought about uh, what would I talk about the wisdom um, we could talk about in the evenings over the course of the retreat here. And I thought what I really want to talk about is something that I love, which is dukkha. And for those of you that don't know what the word dukkha means, it's translated in English to be suffering, dissatisfaction, disease. And, and, and I, know, I know this idea of dukkha, this dissatisfaction or dis-ease, it seems like it's an unpleasant thing. And even when I have felt it, and I still feel it in my life, it does feel unpleasant. But the reason why I like talking about it is because the most profound things that have ever happened to me, the most freest, most unbelievable things that have ever happened, happened through Dukkha. They didn't happen when things were going really, really good. They happened when things were not so good. Something was amiss. And somehow I had the capacity to stay with that. Something is amiss. And I was able to see something I had not seen before. This is sort of what the Buddha said right before he became enlightened. He said that he went through this process and then he saw something that he had not seen before. Um, but what got him to that point of awakening is this profound moment where he was dying, basically. You know, for those of you that don't know Buddha's life, I'm gonna, I am talk a little bit about it, but by and large, he came from a lot of uh, refinement. He came from a lot of what we would consider, he came from the good love. He had money and he had privilege and he had uh, stuff. He had what I would consider, that's the life I want. He had that. And even with all of that privilege and all of that uh, opportunity that he had, he wasn't happy any more than you and I are. I mean, I, I always thought it was about what I grew up with and the lack of what I had. That's what I thought was the cause of my suffering. So the whole point of going to law school and graduating and becoming a lawyer was because I figured being in the projects where I grew up, that's what was the problem. So I just got to get to law school and then everything's going to be great. And I got to law school and then I failed the bar twice. And I was like, okay, I just got to get past the bar. If I can just get past the bar, then everything's going to be okay. Then it's going to be great. Uh, no. So I just kept 
thinking it was going to be something else that was going to happen. And then everything was going to be great. And all of my best laid plans just didn't work. I mean, some good came, you pass the bar and you can get a better job, but then you hate your job. So sort of like everything that I could get and had access to, it had some goodness to it, but it was always limited. And this is what Buddha saw. He saw the limitations of everything he thought was so well and good. And he, he told this story where he had this party and a lot of friends were over and they all looked great and shiny and bright when they first got to the party. And then late in the night, he woke up and he saw them sleep lying around, having been drunk. And, you know, we don't look so beautiful when we're kind of out, passed out somewhere on the couch or something, laying on the floor or whatever. And he just recognized, yeah, something is amiss here. Something's not right. And he uh, snuck out, left his wife and kid, and went on this search to find, uh, I, I think he went to search to find the point of all of this, sort of like what happened with me. I finally stopped and went to find the point of all of this. And he first, I didn't plan on talking about this, but I guess I have to set this up. So he first, he goes to these uh, known teachers that were uh, good in deep concentration, Jhana. They were, uh, they were like the top teachers in, of his time. And he found them and he practiced with them. And um, in his practicing, he learned how to do deep dana, deep uh, concentration. And uh, he can, he could, uh, uh, in some respects, his teacher said that he was better than they were. And so they wanted him to stay on at the monastery and help. They figured if you stay here, then when students come, we will do wondrous things in helping people with their concentration, with their capacity to reach, you know, heights in their minds. Um, and those of you that have ever been in deep concentration, there's kind of like a pleasurable connection to it. You know, it's like, this is what I want. This is the place I want to reside in all the time because you're just so equanimous and it's so pleasurable. In fact, pleasure is one of the factors that you need to get into deep concentration. And many people can't get into deep concentration, not because they don't have the capacity, but because they won't allow themselves to be in that pleasurable state. It's not the easiest thing to do, but it's so pleasurable that uh, you're almost afraid of it. And so, but the Buddha said, yeah, this is not going to help me because no matter how deep in concentration he would get, it's still a mind state and it would still fall apart at some point. It's conditioned, it's put together, and then it's going to fall apart. And then you're back to the same difficulties, same knee pain, same struggle, same backache, same problems. And so he decided that this is not... This uh, jhana, it's not that you don't use don, jhana, but jhana as the way to enlightenment, uh, that was not it. And so he left his teachers to their deep chagrin, and he found a group of uh, friends, and they all went and started practicing the Jains tradition of uh, ascetic practices. So some of you might know this, but I'm just tell you for the people that don't know it. He went and he practiced in this, the opposite. These practitioners were, they completely denied any pleasure in the body and would not, um, uh, they didn't succumb to pleasure of eating, 
sleeping, anything. I mean, they he was down to a grain of rice a day. I can't even imagine. But he was young and he he was very diligent and striving and disciplined. And so he would he would barely eat and um they basically practiced day in and day out and sort of this idea that you could transcend the pain of the body. And uh, so anyone that was the strong practitioner could transcend beyond whatever pain was there. And he could get into deep pain. At some point he said that he could stick his finger in his belly hole and he could feel his back, uh, the skeleton in his back. Um, yeah, but that wasn't doing it either. He was basically dying. I think there's a sutta where there were some datas that were looking at him saying, is he dead? I think he's dead. <laughs> no, he's not dead. Look, I think he's dead. <laughs> I can't believe it, but they were like talking about him, looking at him. He's a goner. <laughs> he didn't do it. But in that midst of all that discomfort, he had a thought. And there's a couple of things here I want to point out before I start talking about Dukkha. In the midst of his dif difficulty, he had a thought. He was not in some state where thinking didn't exist. He had a thought, a memory about being a kid at his uh, house, you know, with his parents' property. And he was sitting under this rose apple tree and there was all this stuff going on, but he was peaceful. And there was stuff going on and he could see it. And he was part of it, but he wasn't part of it. He had somehow, he was resting in a degree of samadhi that was different than his jhana, and it was different than just bearing pain. And in that, he thought something that I have never forgotten. He thought this phrase, this is what it's translated to be, might there be another way? Might there be another way? So you have to think about this for a moment. He had tried the jhanas didn't work, deep concentration, whatever that practice was, it didn't work. He had tried the aesthetics, that didn't work. And uh, I mean, aesthetics, and it didn't work. And he, in this moment of thinking about this, he wanted to try it out and see what was going on there. But he, in order for me to do that, in order for him to do that, he had to start eating because he was dying. So he was going to have to eat something and get his strength back. And of course, as soon as he started eating, what do you think his friends did? They left him. They figured he can't cut it. And they left him. So he's sitting there and he's thinking, might there be another way? Can I try something different? Something he believed in, something he thought let me try this, not what someone has told me. Let me try this. This, I think, is very important when it comes to dealing with dukkha. Something that we don't always talk about. We want to learn about dukkha, which we're going to talk about here. But in order for us to begin to move through this practice, we have to be willing to look at dukkha that showing up for us in any given moment and decide for ourselves, how am I gonna deal with this? What am I gonna do? You may have to make it up, whatever. I'm gonna do something, what am I gonna do? But in that moment, you are stuck in this place between falling into it or considering something else. And I think that dukkha is the doorway to our liberation. That's why I think it's the first, what the Buddha called noble truth. We say it as noble truth, like a, a noun, but uh, Pali is more like a verb. So it's really more of the first ennobling truth, the first 
truth to ennoble you in your life is there is dukkha and you know it. And so I want to talk about what he said you should do with this dukkha. He said dukkha should be known. The cause by which dukkha comes into play should be known. The diversity in dukkha should be known. The result of dukkha should be known. The cessation of dukkha should be known and the path of practice for the cessation of dukkha should be known. We have to know all this. This is around, think of it like this. When that anxiety shows up, that restlessness, and you hate it so much, what we automatically think is, if I get rid of this restlessness, I'm going to have a peaceful time. But restlessness is inherent in practice. It's not going anywhere. Even if you get rid of it in this sit, it'll be back in the next one. So then you get rid of it in that one. You just get rid of it, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Finally, it's gone. This retreat, whew, I got it. Gone. Yeah. When you go home, first sit, it'll be right back. <laughs> It doesn't, it's, it's a part of practice. So in order for us to deal with restlessness, we have to begin to be willing to get to know it. Get to know what is this restlessness that other people call it restlessness. What do you call it? And I begin to learn that what I was calling anxiety and panic was ultimately just chi moving in the body, wind moving in the body. And when I finally stopped fighting the wind, it just was windy, windy, windy. And then it began to settle down. And every once in a while, windy, 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 and it would settle down. So what he said dukkha is, is this birth, this constant coming into being is dukkha because as soon as something comes into being, it will have a duration and it will die. It will cease. So dukkha is this coming into being, this aging, changing nature of it, and this ending. It's the sorrow and lamentation and mental anguish we have in this existence that we live in, that we can't get out of. That even if you are young and there's nothing wrong with the body. And like with the Buddha, he was fine. And then by the time he was older, he had a bad back. You know, laying on all those roots, you can only do it just so long and it's gonna catch up with you. I don't care what kind of age you are. And so sure enough, every one of us are gonna have sorrow from people dying, lamentation, pain, distress, and despair. Um, it's all dukkha associating with things that we uh, don't like, that's dukkha. Separation from the things we do like, that's dukkha. Not getting what we want, that's dukkha. So it's this, uh, this world that we live in that we're gonna talk about tomorrow more distinctly, but all of that coming together is what causes dukkha. And it is inherent in this human body that dukkha will exist and that we as practitioners need to get to know it. So we need to know how this dukkha comes into play. So we'll talk about that tomorrow. But today, a little bit more about dukkha. One is there is major dukkha and there is minor dukkha. I mean, I just thought it was all bad, but there's major dukkha, minor dukkha. There is slowly fading dukkha, and there is quickly, quickly fading dukkha. Did you know that? Sometimes things go quickly. Sometimes they drag on, lay long into the night. Some thoughts will come and go. Some thoughts linger, 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 linger. Some dukkha... You know, like when my mom died, it was major. When my son died, major. But I've had friends that have died and yeah, it's sad. 
but you know, short lived. It was quick. It was gone. So there's like major, minor. There's slow fading dukkha, quick fading dukkha. You got to begin to see this willingness to see how's this moving through? What's actually happening with this? Then he said, there's a result of dukkha. Um, he says, some people, when they come face to face with dukkha, they will beat their breast and they will get upset. They will pound their fist and wish it would go away, do whatever. Um, he was saying that most of us, this is what we feel. We get upset when dukkha comes. But when they are exhausted, and they cannot do anything else, sort of like with him. He was exhausted, dying, I'm done. In that moment, you have a choice. You can either fall into bewilderment, which is, okay, get yourself together, try it again, let's do it again. This path that isn't seeming to work to get rid of this dukkha, or you can take up what he called a noble search. And a noble search is this investigating dukkha. I'm going to investigate where this is coming from. I'm going to get interested in it. I'm not going to hate it so much. And for me, with my anxiety, I came to this place where I was going to be the queen of anxiety. Anybody could come ask me about anxiety and I could tell them all about it because I finally decided it's not going away. It's just going to be here permanently. So I'm going to live with it. And that moment, I didn't realize that in the moment I was willing to accept the anxiety as a part of meditation, I was actually creating the space. Might there be another way? So instead of me fighting it, I'm going to accept it. And I'm going to have this capacity, a relationship with this dukkha, with this anxiety, that uh, I was going to give it an honorable space, like uh, Kintsugi, you know? I'm going to do that. I'm going to put some gold resin on it, and all of a sudden, I'm going to be the queen. In that, I didn't realize, but in that process, I actually shifted my relationship with it. So this is what I want to talk about. Is there three things I think we have to do in order to be with dukkha in a way that makes dukkha itself liberating? So if you think about it, the Buddha didn't say that the um that dukkha is in and of itself that, that somehow or another liberation comes, excuse me, from uh, getting rid of dukkha. What he said was the path to awakening starts with a recognition of dukkha. It starts there. As soon as you begin to recognize this is dukkha, this is something to be understood, not something to be got rid of but something to be understood, then you're on this sort of path to liberation. So I'm gonna give you an example. First thing we gotta do is shift our perspective. We gotta look at a diff different perspective. So here's my example. I had a brother who was a carpenter he knew wood and he knew dimensions. He knew construction, period. Um, and I found a table that I, I have a little tiny apartment. It's a little tiny uh, um, studio apartment. And there's a little tiny section that you could call a dining room. <laughs> it's really big enough for one table. 
maybe some chairs. And I measured and measured and I saw this round glass table. And I remember someone saying, if you get a glass table for a small apartment, it won't look so big. So I said, oh, this is it. I measured, 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 it fit. So I go and I get this glass table and I take it back to my house and I set it up, built it myself, didn't even call my brother, built the thing, put it in there, can't even get by the table <laughs> to get to the refrigerator. And I was so pissed because I measured, measured, <laughs> measured. And I knew this table was gonna fit. And it just so happened my brother comes by and I am so upset and he's like, what the hell is that big old table doing in there? And I'm like, you know what? I measured that table. It fit. I don't understand why it doesn't fit. So my, my dining room area <laughs> is a corner. And my brother looks at the table. The base of the table is a square. The top of the table is a circle. So he makes a quarter turn <laughs> and he slides the table right away. I, I was stunned. Just one quarter turn. <laughs> and now the table, the square part, is up against the windowsill. And he slid it. It was perfect. It's what I had measured. <laughs> and I never saw that. So part of what we're trying to do when we come to some uncomfortableness over the course of this week is to not just assume you need to get rid of this. Just, I gotta give, I gotta stop this. I, there's, this is wrong. It shouldn't be like this, this automatic assumption we make. We have to shift our view in this quarter turn that says, this might be exactly what I need to see right here. This difficulty is what I need to see. This is what I need to work with. And we do it on retreat because we can't do it in our ordinary lives. There's too much stuff happening. It's too quick. Things are going too fast. So here, all your ordinary life, all your habits, all your ways of being are going to show up. And so here is where you have the time, the capacity to look at it. So this Making this shift to this may not be, this may not be the curse I think it is. This may actually be the doorway I need to see something else, to see uh, another way. That's the first thing we got to make this uh, quarter turn shift. What did I do with my clock? Well, I could go on forever, so I better keep the clock close. <laughs> so the second thing is that we have to be willing to try something and fail. Try something and fail instead of make everything about knowing how to do it right. Right? You see what I'm saying? Because the Buddha didn't just go out and get awakened. It wasn't like that. It was sloppy, messy. He tried this and he tried that and this was okay, but it really didn't work. And then this was okay. That didn't work. In fact, there's another sutta where the Buddha talks about his thinking. And he talks about how he was thinking about pleasurable things. And he talks about how he was kind of thinking about ill will. He was probably pissed off at all his friends for leaving him. And so he's had his mom died. So he's probably upset about all the stuff that didn't go his way and didn't, I mean, just normal stuff that we think like that. And yet he realized, wait a minute, when I dwell on these things, this happens. When I dwell on like kindness, goodness, uh, happiness, element, this happens. So he began to think, if I dwell on these unwholesome things, I just suffer more. If I dwell on these wholesome things, 
I don't suffer. But if I dwell on them too much, then I get stuck. Mine gets lazy. Mine gets kind of um, tired and I lose my energy. So dwelling on this wholesome stuff is good, but thinking too much on it, even that turns into difficulty. But the thing that I realized when I read that sutta was that the Buddha was thinking. He was sitting there, he was thinking about ill will stuff. The reason why he knew ill will, thinking about aversion, things he doesn't like, being mad. The reason why he knew that that caused suffering is because he was thinking in that way. So this way that we have in our minds that somehow or another, I shouldn't be thinking about this stuff. I should be thinking about this stuff and this stuff needs to go away. It's the, it's wrong view. You are thinking about this. So instead of worrying about whether you should or shouldn't be thinking about it, you should just watch what happens if I sit and think about home all day. What's going to happen? By the evening, you're going to be ready to go home. You're not going to want to be here because you're just going to build up all of this. Or you can sit in an entire sit trying to solve some problem Finally, when the bell rings, you've got it solved. You know exactly what you're going to do. Okay, now I'm ready to start my retreat. And when you sit back down again, it'll come right back. Like, maybe, maybe, well, maybe that won't work. Mm -hmm. And then you'll start the whole process all over again. So this, how can I tell you about this? It's because I've watched myself. And how do I know? It's because the Buddha watched his self. And this process of watching our thinking and watching what we're doing and trying different things to to kind of like see through it rather than this idea that I should know how not to think like that. That thinking is what is the problem. We don't know how to do this. We have to be willing to try something and see what happens. You have to be willing when you're sleepy to try standing up, to try opening your eyes. And it may or may not get you to stop being sleepy, but you just keep trying something. Try, 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 try. And the failure, this, I have to say it as a, that being willing to try and fail because we, our minds will think of it as a failure. So that failure has to be allowed in the practice, something doesn't work and that has to be allowed. It didn't work. Okay, that's what part of practice is. I'll try something else, see what happens. But I'm gonna stay interested in this difficulty. So the Buddha wasn't always into his stuff. There's a, there's a, a a lay practitioner that went to the Buddha one time, um, it's his, uh, I think it's his last name is Tupasa and, uh, or Tapasa, depending on how they pronounce it in Pali. But he goes to the Buddha one time and he says, I love this. He says, we are householders who indulge in sensuality delight in sensuality, <laughs> enjoy sensuality, and rejoice in sensuality. For us, <laughs> renunciation seems like a sheer drop-off. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that sound like the way we think? Yes, it is a sheer drop-off. He says, yet I've heard that in this doctrine and discipline, the hearts of the very young monks Leap up at renunciation, grow confident, steadfast, and firm, seeing it as peace. So right here is where this doctrine and discipline is contrary to the great mass of people. Does that make sense? He's like talking the truth. He's like speaking truth to power. And the Buddha agreed. He said that when he even 
myself before my awakening when I was an unawakened bodhisattva. The thought would come to him, renunciation is good, seclusion is good, but my heart did not leap up at renunciation. It didn't grow confident. It wasn't steadfast and firm, seeing it as peace. But the thought occurred to me, what is the cause? What is the reason why my heart doesn't leap up at renunciation, doesn't grow confident, steadfast or firm, seeing it as peace? And then the thought occurred that I haven't seen the drawback of mm -hmm. sensual pleasures. Mm -hmm. I haven't pursued that, this idea, is there a drawback? to sensual pleasure. I haven't understood the reward of renunciation. I haven't familiarized myself with that. That's why my heart doesn't leap up at renunciation, doesn't grow confident, steadfast, or firm, or uh, seeing it as peace. So what the Buddha is pointing to is, to me, when we begin to see these habits and we try these different things to try to work with it, this difficulty, we're trying some pain, we'll try moving a little bit, see if that happens. We'll try just sitting with it and being still with it, see if that helps. And all the while, it's still there. And there's a part that we have to actually see the drawback to our aversion to that pain. You see what I'm pointing to here? Mm -hmm. I had to see the drawback to my aversion to the anxiety. And when I had finally resolved that the anxiety will not go away, it did go away, but I resolved it was not going away. I'm not gonna have any more aversion to it. I'm just gonna be with it. Then I could see the drawback of my aversion to the anxiety was actually preventing me from enjoying the sits because I was so just overwhelmed by trying to get rid of the anxiety. And I ultimately, when I settled and just accepted it, what I began to see is that this was a lot of old trauma in the body that needed to be moved through. I needed to let go of a lot of old energy that the body had stored the same way it stores fat, it stores nutrients, vitamins, it stores air. That's why we can live with the air gone for a few minutes before we die is because the body stores air. But I had to see that this was not about me and what I was doing and whether I was good enough. This was a part of the process. And when I begin to see the drawback of trying to find some way to get rid of this anxiety, when I begin to see the drawback of that, and I begin to see the reward of just the restraint of allowing the anxiety to just be here, it's okay. I'm not dying. I'm not having a heart attack, no matter how much my mind is trying to convince me I am, I am not having a heart attack. I begin to settle down with this anxiety and actually gave the body the right amount of energy to do what it needed to do to shift all that energy. But all my fighting and getting in the way, trying to fix what the body knew what to do, I'm trying to fix it was just creating more anxiety, more difficulty, more problems. So what we're doing is trying to find some way to stay in the present moment. And some difficulty comes up, some, we're going to talk about more of these hindrances tomorrow, but some difficulty, one of these things we call hindrances, they show up and they start causing us all kinds of grief. And we start fighting with them to try to get rid of them, to fix them. Somehow, I got to make my sit better because the ideal sit is the one that's 
blissful, peaceful, and you're like levitated up like a hoverboard. <laughs> That's what we think is the perfect sit. But those hoverboard sits, they come, they go, and they are not going to get you any closer to enlightenment. Maybe it'll keep you on the cushion because you keep trying to get there, but it's not going to get you to enlightenment. But then you'll have to sit where there's so much difficulty, so much difficulty. You're trying, trying, trying. Walking comes. You go out, you walk back and forth, walk back and forth. Stay here, stay here, stay here. You come back in. Difficulty comes. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And then you'll see almost like the door just opens up, like a window opens up and you're like, Oh, I see what I'm doing. I want to give you an example. I used to have this pain in this right side. I have arthritis on this right side. My ankles jacked up, my knees jacked up, the hips jacked up, pain on this side. And so I am just so upset because I cannot get this pain to go away and it's killing me. And then I go and I walk and I come back. I don't even walk very well. I hate it. I just don't walk right. Everybody else walks right. I don't walk right. I come back and I sit down and I feel myself like I've got my arm here, leaning down on this side, pressing down on this side. I feel myself like leaning down. I still lean this way all the time. And when I felt this kind of pressing down, I realized, oh shit, that's where the, <laughs> oh, loosen it up. I had to put my arm on the side just so I could stop this habit energy of pressing down on my right side. And it, it isn't always like that, but it is always every discomfort you have your mental anguish is coming from you. That's what we're trying to look at. That mental anguish, somehow or another, is what you're doing. And you can't see that you're doing it because you're so busy trying to fix it. And you keep trying to fix. It's like holding a hot iron in your hand crying because it's burning and trying your best to squeeze the burn out. <laughs> not going anywhere. It is just hurting and hurting. And you are like, please. <laughs> but that's what we're doing. That's the way we're treating the difficulty, our aversion of it is making it worse. Our desire to have it go away is making it worse. And we can't see that. So you need a shift in your perspective that this difficulty is a good thing. And then you gotta be willing to give yourself permission to try something and fail. And then try something else, fail. Try something else, fail. Don't worry about it. Because eventually, as you try and fail, you are going to begin to see the drawback that's keeping you caught in this. And in that drawback, you will see the reward of letting go, this renunciation, this restraint, and letting go. So the third and last thing that I think the Buddha points to if we're going to deal with this dukkha, and dukkha is to be known, it's to be understood. So we need to see dukkha and we need to be okay with seeing the difficulties that show up on a retreat. But there are some structures here because dukkha comes out of some kind of pain. You know, we are in physical pain sitting here. It's not like I don't have arthritis and arthritis isn't painful. If I could somehow think my way through, the arthritis won't really be painful. Yeah. 
it is painful, but I can't make arthritis go away no matter how much I want it to go away. So instead, I have to begin to understand that the arthritis is here sometimes and it's not here sometimes. And sometimes I can walk better than other times. Sometimes it works out just fine, sometimes not. But somehow in the noticing of the reality of this arthritis, treating it with more care and kindness, I can begin to understand where my liberation lies within it. And so sometimes when it's really bad, there are certain things I just don't do. And then when it's not so bad, I can do some things. And when it's not bad at all, I can do lots of things. Sometimes I can walk around with it being very painful and I just still walk around with it. I'm kind of used to it now. But it comes from letting go of the aversion, not I don't have any more arthritis. And that this third thing is that we use this tool of mindfulness for awakening. So we are using mindfulness as a process to help us awaken, to help us see into the nature of what's actually happening. He said, Buddha said that dukkha comes from pain. We suffer because of pain, because of conditioned experience. So coming on a retreat where you've given up your phone is a conditioned experience that difficulty is going to arise. It's inherent. It's why I want you to give up your phone so you can bring up all this difficulty and you can begin to look at it. Not so you can be distracted. You can have your phone. Difficulty comes up in a sit. You just get distracted. You go over and use your phone, do whatever, play the little games. And then I'm okay. Okay, it's not so bad. But if you never have that dukkha rise up and practice with it through this trial and error, then you'll never see the freedom that's possible. You'll just see the distraction of mind. So we want to use mindfulness as a tool to help us see the difficulty. And it's also uh, suffering comes from change because of impermanence. This is the fact that some things rise, things pass all the time. But this is what the Buddha said, our meditation practice, walking on this eightfold path. This is what he said was the point of it. He said, it is for the full comprehension, the clear understanding, the ending and abandonment of these three forms of suffering that this practice is to be cultivated. So in this cultivation of this practice, we can learn to let go of the suffering of pain. I have pain, but I don't suffer like I used to. We can let go of the suffering of conditioned existence. I have conditioned experiences that, yeah, they bring up difficulty, but I don't suffer from it. And we can let go of the pain or the suffering that is caused by the fact that things come and go and begin in the endings of things. Things end in my life, just like in everyone else's. And yet I don't suffer because of those endings. So there's a way in which this practice is not pointing towards making everything better. It's pointed towards having a sense of well-being, whether you are in fact in a moment of well-being or in a moment of non-well-being. But that sense of well-being doesn't go away. That's what remains, even though circumstances may not be the way you want them to be. That's what we're doing this practice for. And we need to be in an environment that we're secluded, that we're with other practitioners together and we're all doing this together 
and we are willing to look at dukkha in a different light. So that that's what I want to start our retreat. This is what we're we're doing here. This is what we're uh, uh, our point is. So I have one other poem. I was going to read this other book, but I decided what I really want to do is this other poem. Here it is. This is called The Cure, and it's by Albert Huffstickler. This is what Albert says. We think we get over things. We don't get over things. Or say we get over the measles, but not a broken heart. We need to make that distinction. The things that become part of our experience never become less part of our experience. How can I say it? The way to get over a life is to die. Short of that, you move with it. You let the pain be pain, not in the hopes that it will vanish, but in the faith that it will fit in, find its place in the shape of things. And be then not any less pain than true to form. Because everything natural has an inherent shape and will flow towards it. And a life is as natural as a leaf. That's what we're looking for. Not the end of a thing, but the shape of it. Wisdom is seeing the shape of your life without obliterating or getting over a single instance of it. So let's sit for a moment. Thank you so much for your kind attention.